have like a little flamingo over your shoulder in the next You know, pirates got parrots. I can have flamingos. Let me have this. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Frankie. He's, uh, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. You don't need to know. You don't need to understand this. <laughs> Hello, friends, family, and everyone in between. Welcome to another exciting edition. It's the next volume. It's the next chapter of the Feel Good Podcast. The podcast where we chat with fun and interesting people and ask them about what makes them feel good and the good they put in the world. I am your... Indubitably. <laughs> I'm your good co-host, Mike Osgood, and with me, as always, is the your, furry, the fantastic... Your Phil co-host, Byron Filler. Uh, I'm, we're... I'm going to introduce you from now on. Yeah. You're furry and fantastic. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the recognition. Byron, it's been a little bit since uh, yes. we have chatted and everything like that. What's good yep. with you? So, I had a little bit of a, a vacation last week, so nice. I had a family come into town and visit Portland and see us, and uh, my my cousin and her daughter came in. Unfortunately, it was, like, cold and rainy, and it, like, it snowed one day in April. I, Y'all, it snowed in April. It snowed in mid-April, yeah. which doesn't happen out here which no. was wild it doesn't make sense not at all yeah. but they they were troopers they handled it very well marissa and i took them to like all of our favorite places we also went to go see uh the the tulips so i think it's called the tulip festival at the uh woodshoe tulip farm and like yes. you've never seen anything like this before it's a field no, of really tulips haven't. And it goes on four miles. Four miles. Like tulip. Like I've never seen tulips dip on like into the horizon. Like that was how far it went. It was beautiful. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, wild. Yeah. I'm going this weekend. Oh. And I'm very excited to go and check out the endless array of tulips. The oh, one yeah. thing that, like, every single time I see tulips now, like, the only thing I could think of is Animal Crossing. Yes. L- like, that's how much Animal Crossing played into my quarantine life. And I'm like, oh, if they plant this tulip right here next to this color tulip there, it gets that color, right? It, yeah, it that's very what It is the way they set it up. No. It is very a- Animal Crossing, where it is just, like, yeah. rows and rows of the same colored tulip. And I made the joke, I was like walking around i was like taking photos it's like it's real life animal crossing babe and she was like you're a fucking idiot (laughs) you're a nerd (laughs) no it was it was a lot of fun and then this past weekend from our recording so probably like a couple weekends prior from when this releases was marissa and my uh, first year anniversary yeah so we took uh, a little getaway over to astoria walked around the town did some thrifting i actually found like a really cool uh like old like eight millimeter film splicer that was in like great oh, condition nice. yeah it nice. was super cool 20 bucks easy yeah e- easy and uh, yeah, we wo- we hung out around there. We went to Cannon Beach, and it was just a like a nice, relaxing weekend. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was last week for me. It was just it was nice and relaxing. I'm feeling refreshed. That's what nice. I needed. You look refreshed. You look radiant. Thank you. you look Aww. fantastic. Stop. So good. So Stop. Good. Yes. Mike, what what is good with you? How did you had a week off as well, right? I did have a week off as well. I got to babysit teenage sit. I don't know what the equivalent is of when it's a teenager, but I got to teenage sit my 14-year-old sister-in-law for a week. Yeah. And another set of or another Californian coming up to the Pacific Northwest and mm-hmm. also experiencing all of that snow rain hail rain hail rain hail snow (laughs) she got to experience all that too and it was wild it was crazy one of my neighbor's trees fell down because of all the snow oh no which was wild Uh, i had to go be the good neighbor and help them take apart their tree and stuff it into my 
like landscaping box, whatever it is, the green you, one. You had um, a Jake from State Farm moment. I had a Jake from State Farm moment. Yeah. Um, like a good neighbor, I was there. <laughs> uh, but no, we we had that. But when she was here, we did a variety of fun things. We went to this improv show that was a clue game. Ooh, wait, which was what? super fun. Yeah, what? it was super fun. They had six people up there and six or seven people. Yeah. And everybody was randomly assigned a character. One person was the body and one person was the murderer. And only the murderer knew who the murderer was. And they asked for a occupation that was like your dream job when you were little. And oh. I shouted out mine, which was being a secret agent. Ooh. And they did a whole clue game based off being secret agents and it was hilarious they did it <laughs> so well i i want to go back i want to go chat with them i want to go learn more about it i want to go do awesome. improv with them so i it was to... such a good one i'll shoot you the information after this please for sure. i've definitely been having an itch for improv because like i did it through college and yeah. all the way through to just like a couple years out of college i miss it it's you, so good. It's so delightful. It really is. <laughs> it, well, it's, it keeps you sharp. It especially well. I feel like I've developed so many good social skills that are about learning how to like. There's nothing that gets you to have good skill sets in like socialization, like learning how to build a scene with someone and tell Seriously. a story yeah. without any prior knowledge of what that's supposed to be. And all you have is each other. And all you have is to trust somebody else. And that's, that's a really powerful thing. So I'd love yes, to, and. Yes, yes and, and yes and I, my favorite thing is no. And um, no. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> But yeah, we had a great time, and then just a little bit of work and all that kind of stuff. That's what's been good with me. You wonder what else is good? What else is good, Mike? Our guest today. Uh, before we tell you about that, make sure you like and subscribe to us on YouTube. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find those, and make sure you follow us there. But we love you guys. Find us on YouTube. Come see our beautiful faces. They're cute. Follow us on social media as well. We're at Phil Good Pod on Instagram, TikTok, yes. Twitter, like wherever you want to find us. We are. We're there. We're there. And we love Because like you. good podcasters, the Phil we're Good there. Podcast is there. <laughs> We're there. Uh, but Byron, can you tell us about who we're chatting with today? Today, our guest is Daniel Clark. He is the director of Behind the Curve, which was uh, the documentary about the Flat Earth community. And it goes through ob observing them. Uh, we He's also been doing a bunch of other uh, projects. He's an uh, executive producer on uh, In My Own World for Vice TV. He's also been... Uh, an editor on a bunch of projects for uh, like Echo in the Canyon. He worked on Cheer season two, and he's got like a bunch of other really cool stuff that we talk about in the interview. And I think we should let him speak for himself because he. I think we should too. Yeah, he he's very, and this is a different episode. We it's quiet. It's introspective. It's not anything like that we've done before, and I'm excited to see what y'all think of it so so shall, shall we, we do a shall we do a quieter transition yeah. to this yeah all right here you go guys <laughs> Everybody put your game faces on welcome back Fire, take everybody <laughs> well yeah welcome back everyone to uh we today are speaking with the amazing the introspective the star seeking daniel clark hello hello daniel hello, how daniel. how are you doing today today i'm good it's been a slow but nice saturday is it That's how all saturday should be a year is it sunny down i know it's been hot in la lately is it uh sunny down there today or is it like what's going on oh man it's sunny every day except for <laughs> one or two days a year but it's so uh, it's you know it's one of those things that i it's it's so consistent that i take it for granted and 
that's something I shouldn't do, I think. We just need you to soak it up a little bit extra for us in the okay. Pacific Northwest <laughs> who are missing it terribly. I'm not. So much. Dude, I, I am. Wh- that's why I left. I mean, while I enjoy <laughs> a good rain, I, I'm i a California kid born and raised, and I am now suffering from like a deficiency of vitamin D in my life. And I just need that sun. I need nah. a little bit of that. So it's now Daniel's responsibility to just soak up a little bit extra for me, please. <laughs> for for him, I'm I'm good. I've <laughs> I've got vitamin D over here. The fre- oh, my freckles need a little extra. So that's uh, it. But so Daniel, before we get into more about what is good about you and the good that you're putting into the world, we have to acknowledge the bad ladies and gentlemen you know it you love it it's the moment of bad we're going to attempt to constrain ourselves to 60 seconds and fail to talk about what was bothering us this week and then we're gonna make it be gone big Big gone um mike do you want to start do you want me to start what what are you feeling today i'll I'll let you start today all right i get it off your chest i want to talk about clients who can't make up their mind now i'm gonna preach yeah i'm gonna preface this by saying the client that i'm working with i really do love them there's not a lot that i can actually complain about it's really just that because I'm working in post-production it's very specific and technical. You just, it's inevitable that you end up dealing with people who kind of just shut down and then they do weird things like reschedule your tasks three times in the span of 24 hours. No, I don't care what I'm doing, but I would like to do it long enough to <laughs> meet a deadline. <laughs> Because that's what I'm being paid to do. Oh, man. So I'm going to take picky and and self-conscious clients. And I'm I'm not going to begone the clients. I'm going (laughs) to begone their anxiety. Because I know that that's what it's about. Well, begone. 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 (laughs) All right. I'll go next. I'll go next. We now live in the Pacific Northwest. It's fun. It's great. People say it's chill. But driving is not. People come out and they talk trash about California drivers. But I'm going to talk a little trash about people from Washington and Oregon. And learn that, you know, you have this vibe of everything is chill and calm and peaceful. Yet you drive like a bat out of hell. Like... I've gotten cut off like four times every single day that I go out and I drive. I've had seen people run red lights. I've seen motorcycles make illegal left turns while other cars are coming out like they are late for something. I don't know, but I'm like, man, take your safety into consideration. (laughs) And also like traffic. They're terrible here. They don't know how to merge. It's crazy. <laughs> and then you're stuck on a freaking highway for like two hours in the middle of a forest. And there's nothing interesting to look at because it's just tree there, tree there. It's two lanes. And then you're stuck and with your own thoughts. So I'm going to take all of the driving of the Pacific Northwest, consolidate it into a little ball. I'm going to package it up, stuff it in a can, and I'm going to launch that shit. And I'm going to make a big <laughs> arm. My God. This is left over from our call with you yesterday. This is, yeah, this is residual. <laughs> Marissa and I, we were stuck in that same traffic, like a little bit closer to your house. And we called, uh, we called Mike and we're like, hey, Mike, how are you doing? And it, all it was was screaming. <laughs> so, Daniel, I'm trying to save your ears a little bit. Uh, not uh, to your ears no. today, so. Is that why your mic we're, was so low this morning? That's exactly <laughs> why my mic was so low this morning. It was like preemptive. <laughs> saving your eardrums from me just being in the background like ah! yeah so we're, we're so we're gonna be gone all that bad traffic and all the stress that comes with the bad traffic be gone deuces right. be gone but Daniel, enough about us like what <laughs> what's going wrong in your life well you know what big things aside outside of what i have, am experiencing on a moment-to-moment basis 
something that is really getting to me is just the technology that I have, which is a blessing, let's be real. But the, when the technology gets in the way of doing just what you need to do, and I'm talking yes. about computers and software, yes. I click it and it doesn't want to do it. And then about a minute later, it's like, oh, that, yeah, I'll do that. So, you know, <laughs> when the technology gets in the way of the creativity, it's very frustrating. And I feel like, you know, just really stops me from wanting to even work on stuff. But it's Preach. gone now. Now the technology is gone. Probably as I'm saying this, like, it's probably really blurry and the Internet's being slow or something is happening at the moment. And that's just, you know what, I'm going to have to just accept that as part of this modern world and an artifact that we'll look back on and smile. And say, remember? Be like, wasn't that wasn't that so cute? Yeah. Remember when we used to work on these little like physical domains? Yeah. And stuff? <laughs> it's crazy. Oh man, well we're gonna take faulty technology. We're gonna make it be gone. Be yeah. gone. Man, I well, had a, any hoozle. Yeah, I actually I had a coworker one set one time where uh, it, was, it was funny talking about the context of production. Is like, which do you like more, Mac or PC, Avid or Premiere? Divin- like, what do you like? He was like, they're all terrible. <laughs> they're all just bad. They all have their pros, and they all have a shit ton of cons. Exactly. Moving on from the bads now that they are gone. Um, Daniel, like every good superhero. They have an origin story and we would Mm. love to learn about and we'd love for you to tell our audience what's that special sauce that made you the person you are today. Um, A lot of really small little moments, you know, these little decisions that affect the rest of your life. Uh, They all I think it all started when I was graduating college. This is like this is the pivotal moment in my life. I was going to go to New York University. I was like, I was studying audio engineering. And so like, all I wanted to do was make records and be a cool guy. Couldn't get a job (laughs) anywhere in New York. And therefore I couldn't afford, like I got a decent scholarship from New York, but they weren't going to pay for my whole way. That's crazy. Mm. So uh, like in order to even move or live there, I needed to like have a job and I just could not get anything. And my, somebody like a professor that I, studied under at at my university in Indiana, sent me like this job posting said, you might be good for this. So I applied on a whim, got an interview. And I said to myself, I don't really go on a lot of job interviews, it might be good experience just to do this. What harm could it do? I'm just going to go get experience doing an interview, get those nerves out, make myself better. So when I go to New York, I can do interviews really well. It was at the University of Notre Dame. And it was for like a production assistant in like the theater and film department. And I was like, uh, I went there, did my interview. The very next day, I got a call saying I was offered the job. And I called my dad. (laughs) And I was like, what do I do? And he's like, well, you know, like, you could just work for a year and then go back. And New York had a deferment that you could do for a year. So I was like, all right, I'll do that. And then I went to Notre Dame. And then I didn't go to New York. And then I stayed another two years at Notre Dame. And then I decided after that, I was like, now I'm going to go. And that's when I fell in love with film was working there i was like oh i could do film as a career it's way more viable than music because at this point it was like the beginning or not even the beginning but it was like peak napster times and like the music industry just there was no money in it anymore it was just declining nobody was making any money in music anymore so it was like a bad time to get into that industry and i was like i could do film and then i just decided to do it and once again i was going to go to new york when i graduated uh from grad school and had an internship lined up and they, they like offered me the internship in New York. But then I was like waiting for this, uh, uh, this, I don't know what you'd call it, like apprenticeship for the Academy of TV, uh, in LA. And I told the guy who was offering me the internship this, I was like, I'm still up for this, uh, apprenticeship. So just so you know, I want to take your internship in New York, but if I get this, obviously I have to take this. And he got so indignant. And so mad, he said, "Forget it. It's off the table. You're not. You're not wanted here." Uh, and then I also didn't get the apprenticeship, but I ended up uh, getting another thing out in L.A. So I was going to go to New York again, and decided I'm just going to go to L.A. Give that a shot. Eventually, I'll make my way to New York, and never did. One day. <laughs> and that uh, internship that I did get in L.A. was in documentary, which I didn't really necessarily plan on, but it was just like something I was interested in anyway. 
So I got that, and that has just that led me to both going to Notre Dame led me to the internship. <laughs> And it also led me to wow. all my friends. And then the internship led to a whole other group of friends uh, and a whole other yeah. world that opened up. So all that was based off of that one email that I got about a job opening in Indiana. So I mean, that, so that's, that's, that's serendipity my pivotal moment. in the works. That's yeah. a, just a I don't know if that tiny logic little followed. snowball that <laughs> No, it, it does. Followed. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would be interested to know, like, what what kept you doing because obviously like you went on to continue doing documentaries and when you're in LA there like everything kind of like blends together in terms of the work that you can do so what kept you mm -hmm. doing documentaries well you know when so when I started off um it was just me and this couple who owned the company and I was their intern essentially I worked for twenty dollars a day this is back when people were cool with that. Not, honestly, $20 a <laughs> yeah. day was better than most were getting. Yeah, yeah um, it was. Damn. And this is the dumb part. It was part of my uh, grad school curriculum. So I needed to work for six weeks for free in an industry capacity. Like, I, I wasn't allowed to get paid, which was like, and I was what? actively paying my college. This is... The, the scary part is the that it's like somehow school. re like i did back then somehow it was like standard that's reasonable yeah and it, yeah i mean that sucks that that's what that was yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna complain about my time working at spencer gifts anymore <laughs> uh, and like you know making minimum wage and getting that stuff that yeah. that's insane that's but such I got... low yeah yeah um but somehow i made it work i think i had a lot of like fafsa student loans that kept yeah. me mm. paying rent in not a bad place at all. I was, I was not, I didn't know how bad the situation was for me. Cause at the time I was like, this is pretty good. Uh, yeah. but anyway, so the company I was at, they were, they were very nice to me and they treated me very well. And they asked me to, at the end of my internship to become like an assistant on their documentary shoots. So I would go out with the director and it would just be the two of us. And we would just go film this things. Like we went to North Carolina a lot and filmed this documentary. I was an editor on that for a long time also. And that's kind of where I built all these credits that most people need to jump through all these hoops to get an assistant editor credit to, to like become a production assistant first. Like I didn't have to do that somehow because I worked at such a small company. Definitely there was an, there, there was a lot of like luck involved and a lot of privilege involved in my position being there anyway. So I was able to just kind of leapfrog over and become an editor, a documentary editor right away. And I was able to like learn a lot of camera tricks and, and, and learn how to make a documentary in the field at the same time. So I kind of had all these skills and all these credentials that then I was hired onto other projects. And this company kept hiring me back for other things that they were doing. So it was really a lot of fun. I got to travel the world with them to do like this thing on video games. I, I got to, you know, edit a lot. And then I, was able to jump across to different companies and that kind of led me to where I am. So I lived in the documentary world and I like it because there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of layers of the team. So it's not like, you know, you're dealing with, um, a field producer and an AD and like, then you have to like go through like the associate producer. It's just kind of like all one small company because most documentaries are yeah. not funded well enough to actually pay for a lot of staff. So, if you're the editor, you know, you're also making a lot of decisions about the graphics that are going into things. And like, mm -hmm. you can tell the director what they need to film to make your scene work, you know, like that kind of thing. So, well, so then you um, have a lot more creative control wearing multiple hats. Yeah. And it was fun. And a lot of the things that we worked on were pretty long term. So it was, you have a lot of friendships, you meet a lot of people and my, friends my girlfriend my business partners like they're all from this same company and it's kind of weird like this small company just kind of churned through a bunch of people but we yeah. all met on the other side i don't know That's if you've seen amazing. band of brothers but it's kind of like that like we're all just kind of like oh yeah you, you work there oh I remember that yeah it kind of is like it's a good metaphor it's a battle like you're going through and you're yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it sounds like it was a struggle bus and a half of you know just financially trying to get through it yeah and also like majority of documentaries take years mm -hmm. to film 
and get all the right interviews and get the story in place. Like what were the motivational factors for you to kind of keep moving with that kind of storytelling? Well, after seeing them do it for a few movies, I was like, I can do that. (laughs) Um, You know, I can go out and film some stuff. And then uh, I worked with this group called finite films. Byron was a part of that for, for a hot minute. Um, And we all, I met Alex Kairos through this same company. So he was editing a documentary for them the same time I was there as an intern. And we kind of met and he's like, Hey, I'm doing this little fun, like narrative short film project. And we became involved and that company kind of turned into its own little beast. And someone hired them to make a documentary about this like esports team. And they knew that I had like, the field skills to like go out and make this. And they hired me to direct it and go out there and film it all. And so, Oh wow. So yeah, that was like the first time I was ever really, I'll say like in charge of like a larger project as a director and shooting. And then after doing that, I was like, look, I can make, I can make a feature documentary. The only reason that one, we stopped making that one is because that company who was hiring us lost all their funding and couldn't pay us anymore. So we're like, all right, well, here's the footage. Mm. But it built a lot of confidence in me that I, that I could do this. And with the right team, we could find a story and tell a story that was worth telling and in a fun, interesting way that we'd want to see as viewers. And that landed you at, you know, you, you and your crew uh, and ended up eventually doing Behind the Curve can you tell tell the listeners and the viewers what that what that film is about and mm-hmm. what your interest was in observing the the flat earth community and making a film about them yeah um we decided we wanted to make a movie about something that interested us and flat earth came up And it was one of those things, as soon as we started looking into it, we're like, we have to tell the story. No one else is doing this right now. This is insane. Like, we can't be the only ones pursuing this movie. And it turns out we were. Like, there were other people, like, Vice was doing, like, a news story on it or something. But it wasn't in the documentary format that we were doing. And so he said, like, let's get on this right away. And we wanted to tell a story about the Flat Earth community. But also we, you know, with our experience in documentaries, we know it can't just be a movie about something. It has to be like deeper than that it can't just be a face value this is what happened here you go so we wanted to explore the idea of belief and how people can believe things that are not provable or just plainly not true or why we come to believe things at all and so that was our mission when we started out and one of the first interviews we did in the movie was with a psychiatrist to kind of get background from him what we should expect when we go out into this world and like what we can possibly like what 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 in your experience because this guy had dealt with flat earthers before and different conspiracy theorists what in your experience can we expect to find out in this world of flat earthers and that led us to this wild world of of flat earthers and i think we made a good metaphorical film about belief overall I would love to know as you're going into like a story when you're taking on something that some might deem controversial or just like fringe in this way, how do you define the line between like a subjective point of view versus an objective? Like how do you have those guardrails that you're able to kind of put in front of yourself to make the story kind of tell itself as opposed to the story that you that people might want you to push yeah i think people along the way were really pushing us to say like oh you have to get like a flat earther and a scientist in the room and have them talk people like when they saw rough cuts around we were like you need that and we were like no i don't think we do because that's not what our movie is our, our movie's not a debate our movie's just like a look at the people involved and what you know when you're filming something even if it's just me in a room with a camera the fact that i have a camera no matter how like unobtrusive it is and usually it's more obtrusive than than not they're wearing a microphone you know like they're 
they're aware that I'm there. And oftentimes it was just the two of us in a room. So how are you going to ignore me? And if you do ignore me, what yeah. are you going to do? Just look at your computer. So there was definitely like my presence is felt in the footage. And I think mm -hmm. that we edit it in such a way that you can sense that you can sense that I'm there. And in a way, like I'm the audience kind of hanging out with these people. So, so, you know, I've never really made a true verite documentary where I'm just trying to pretend like I've never been, I was never there at all. And you just, there was a secret camera that they didn't even know that like, I've never made anything like that because to me, that just seems kind of, unless you can do it in a really, really good way, it seems dishonest to the audience. I mean, it's interesting that you say that and you feel that way because it's, I think, wa watching it and you're seeing what, you know, people like Mark Sargent and uh, some, some of the other people that you interview and you're listening to what they're saying. And it's, I think that what you're talking about, it's so effective because we're right there with you and it's a little... I'm sure you are much more prepared for it, but it is disarming how they speak about it. Not because like, it, you expect what they're going to say. It's how earnest they are when they say it. Mm -hmm. at, at least to me, it was like eye-opening. Like, oh, like this, this is a way of life. This is not just a... a silly little conspiracy theory that they like were looking at on the on the back of a cereal box was there something that going into the experience that maybe like that surprised you the most or maybe you expected you set expectations and they were subverted by like after coming out of those shoots i was often surprised and this is kind of across the board at how open people were immediately to us like i was expecting to go in there and having to like earn their trust quite a bit and i and i would go in first without a camera like i would meet these people and talk to them without cameras and then i'd eventually be like all right i'm gonna put on my camera and we can start talking um but right away they were willing to have me there which you know is i can't say i would be the same for anybody coming to film me I'd be very, very aware of everything they could possibly yeah. capture. And I'd be like, ah, I gotta get rid of all my, I don't know, cat stuff, <laughs> cat toys everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was kind of surprising how willing people were. And then I realized like, you know, a lot of people don't live and work in, in the world of film. So like, obviously like I'm used to having cameras around and I don't think it's super exciting, but to some people like to get getting a chance to tell their story to like the news or to the media of some sort. It's like exciting because it's, you know, it's your chance to, to tell the world your, your side of things or, you know, get a little bit of that, you know, fame. Maybe you, you've been wanting or kind of like live out a little fantasy of, you know, MDV cribs yeah. coming to your home. You know, that's definitely my fantasy. I just want like <laughs> someone who cares about everybody. your house, you know, <laughs> I just want somebody to take a look at my fridge. You know, yeah. just be super excited about the fact that I have a bunch of Chobani yogurt in there. Wow, uh, a bunch. Bunch. You know, you got a Fred Meyer up here, basically Kroger. You get yeah. discounts. Life you have an beautiful. alarming amount of Chobani. <laughs> no, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> a suspicious you got amount. stock up, brother. You got stock up. Yeah, I, yogurt. I something to... you should definitely stock up on. <laughs> exactly you know it's not like it goes bad super quick or anything um well i'd love to know from you in regards to you're, you're getting people in front of cameras and we we deal with this too whenever we're doing this like mm -hmm. someone gets on a camera they kind of put on their camera face do you have like a secret sauce in order to make people more comfortable like what is that thing or do you have like a signature catchphrase that you can just kind of tell people like, <laughs> hey relax no i never say relax that's it's like a trigger word. Um, exactly. I, That's why we'd never say I it. think I, you know, I've been told that I have like a very like calm, not calm, maybe not calming, but like kind of like I don't, I'm not very dynamic and expressive and loud. I'm pretty quiet, soft-spoken generally. And I think when I meet new people, they always say like, oh, you're really quiet. And I think that in the documentary, that kind of works to my advantage because people are like, they want to say they want to fill the silence and that is something i did learn early on and I, I forget exactly where i learned this but sometimes if you just 
stare there. Like if you don't respond to someone and they say something, they're going to continue talking. It's pretty wild to look at. See what I mean? I think those so are like some of the most, <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's one of the most genuine, I'm sorry, as the loud <laughs> dynamic one here, like that, that is the thing that I just love to do is to fill the silence. But that's one of my favorite moments of a documentary is like those, it's those little beats and pauses of really allowing the subject to express themselves. And you're, you're just waiting for that void. You're just waiting for it. You're like, oh, these are kind of like the true things. It's like a, a need to be just filled with something. And if you get comfortable with it, there's, it's like, there's someone else who's gonna, who's not going to be settled by that so they like you get i'm sure you get more because they feel this and maybe that's also about like that feeling of being watched that need to do something because you have an eye on you and Mm -hmm. you you feel you have to make it interesting how often like you're between shooting and like the like maybe things landing on the cutting room floor do you think that you were able to find something either honest or truthful out of people or maybe even something that was just just flat out false or a lie because they just felt not because they felt that they were being attacked but more because they felt they had to do something with with the space you mean like performative kind of reactions or something like yeah i there was a there's a guy in the movie his name is Nathan and he does like the the pink the golf ball on hammers he's just like bouncing a golf ball between yeah. hammers yeah it's wow it's impossible to do it's like the fact that he can do it is astounding matter, <laughs> like hands down like there's nothing funny about that it's a real serious thing that it's impossible to do but he can do it anyway um, <laughs> he got a little high and was like talking to horses and like he was kind of gesturing to me a lot like there was like a lot of like there was a bit of i'm being filmed i need to to be performing for the camera so that all was kind of like when i got back i was like i think there's some good stuff in the beginning and when we go to the bank and other than that oh there was the point where he was reading to me in the car i forgot about that but those like three things were pretty much it and everything else in between like we went around to like this horse farm and we're like walking around for an hour and it was all just kind of like what are we doing <laughs> we're talking to horses bro yeah he was talking to horses exactly. it's like, it was like telling it, them like, like she's preaching to horses about flat earth and i was just like i don't think you do this on your own <laughs> so <laughs> i mean like I, yeah yeah mr buck that's the name of the horse to I, today like, yeah. Yeah, you can see you can see it's just flat it's just flat right it's pretty much no, like that the, that's kind of what it was if there's anything i've learned about what i can see eye to eye with with a flat earther it's talking to animals about anything okay it's true it's pretty universal i did have a whole monologue with my dog this morning about <laughs> trying to eat her breakfast she'll sit there and just stare at you for like 15 minutes while you're making her breakfast and then you put it down and then she doesn't eat it and you're like what are you doing what are your life choices that you're making right now and <laughs> It's that nonverbal communication that just shines through. But also kind of going through not just your conversations with people in regards to like finding the nuggets of truth and finding those performative moments. Like I feel, and tell me if I'm wrong, like kind of a role of a documentarian is finding that balance between truth and fiction. How, how do you go through uh, kind of, identifying those moments and framing yeah. that in your stories i have this uh, like i try to have this conversation a lot but other people just never want to have it with me <laughs> um which We're is like yeah which is like you know documentarians are not journalists there's definitely a responsibility that documentarians should have that they don't like there's actually no accountability for like you can get bad pr maybe but like people and even this is even true with like hollywood biopics or whatever like people are just gonna yeah. people believe that bohemian rhapsody happened the way it happened that movie is like the worst movie i've ever yeah. seen anyway uh, <laughs> i have a lot of things wrong with that but like in the documentary world let's go back to that um <laughs> yeah. like but i but i i do feel like i have a responsibility to tell the story truthfully even if 
literally it's not all true or didn't happen like there's a way you have to make a movie <laughs> that like you need a reaction shot to cut between two moments to make the scene tighter and to make it make sense like the conversations take 30 minutes and you're seeing three lines of that conversation but the job of editors and the job of documentary filmmakers altogether is to condense reality into a, a way that is understandable for an audience so it's not journalism in the fact that we don't have to put like white flashes between edits to let you know that like hey this actually is a time jump but you know i do think there's there's an ethical responsibility with no accountability uh to 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 be truthful and to to not manipulate the truth in a way that is harmful to your subjects or really really misleading but i think people often think that documentaries are journalism and that's why you can get like these like crazy conspiracy documentaries or like these really like far extremist versions of truth do you feel that because the the line is kind of blurred it's just this giant gray space that no one is addressing do you feel that makes you like when you are going out whether it's like you're directing or you're in the editor's seat do you feel that makes you more vulnerable especially if you're going into these like talking with com- like fr- like fringe communities that the back like that there is a level of backlash that you're not that you're not prepared for oh or that um, or well, maybe I'm you to are avoid that yeah <laughs> i think with flat earth you know like we they don't love us but it's not like people want to get us you know it's not like uh people who worked yeah. on like the scientology show had scientologists like follow them around like that was that was like an actual level of threat um versus flat earthers i mean they know me if you really wanted to you could like find my email and get a hold of me and people don't do that you can reach Daniel Clark at no, I'm just Daniel wow. Clark Accounting dot com. <laughs> Fun times, but all this talk about documentaries and things like that, I I would want to kind of learn what are, how do you kind of separate yourself from that after work? What are the things that make you feel good? Um, that you're able to kind of disconnect and put the storytelling behind. After making the movie um, Behind the Curve, uh, there was like a lot of like, I had to come to grips with myself because it felt, I felt really bad that certain people felt like hurt or upset at what, how we portrayed them in the movie. Um, and I kind of don't want to ever do that again because I, I, it's not my goal to make someone look bad or feel bad or be shamed or anything like that. So now when we make projects, me and my me and my company delta v we're like we're gonna find things that are just what they are like there's no there's no like building characters and like there's no like bad guy good guy kind of thing and so that's it's just it's just not for me because i've seen people do it yeah. and i know like i worked on the show cheer and like some people look real bad and real real crappy in that show and yeah some of the things they did were crappy but they're not like horrible people yeah so you know, that's just, it's just not really, if I'm directing something, it's not really the space I want to be in anymore because it upsets me. So, you know, I don't, I can't just forget about that when I come home, but I do like, you know, have a life. I have a girlfriend that I love and is amazing. Like I have my two cats that are incredible and, you know, I just focus on what's in front of me and be a little present and you know mindful, I guess. Uh, I go on walks as much as I can, just like keep my my doctor was like yeah your cholesterol is bad and i was like oh how and, <laughs> De- no, uh, ditto. so like i feel that <laughs> so like i go on walks and you know my girlfriend and i exercise it started during the pandemic really like we were we were working out occasionally yeah. but during the pandemic we're like let's actually get in shape and getting in shape i realized is just something you have to do forever there's no getting in shape yeah. and then you're in shape it's just something that you always have to do till you can't anymore learn that the hard way Mm -hmm. um so yeah i just try to be like you know focus on on what i can control in front of me and then when it comes to our other projects you know finding stories that can say something interesting without having to like exploit a hard word but exploit for lack of a better term anybody or their situation so what kind of 
Are you? Can you talk about what kind of stories I that swear. you're looking at now? You bet. The next big documentary that we have going right now is is about the scientists, the astronomers looking for the next planet in the solar system. So we're working with Mike Brown, who's the guy responsible for demoting Pluto. He <laughs> and his his uh, love so demoting a way to put it. Pluto. Demo- um, I'm so sorry. You don't. You don't deserve to be. We're gonna have to give you a pay cut as well. Yeah, he Aww. keeps he keeps letters Aww. pinned to his door at Caltech uh, that are from children <laughs> begging him to reinstate Pluto as a planet. Um, oh my goodness! <laughs> for the kids, I think he has, his the name of his like TED talk or is it a book? It's at least a TED talk, which is like uh, why I killed Pluto or how I killed Pluto and why it had it coming or something like that. Um, he's got a good sense of humor but anyway he's he he and his his research partner have discovered gravitational evidence that there is another planet in the solar system much farther than pluto and so like all of the evidence is there we just haven't taken a picture of it and that's what it takes to prove it because until then it could just be you know a bunch of dust with a lot of gravity cumulative cumulatively so they're pretty sure it's planet. (laughs) Why are they having such a hard time finding it? What is going into that for them? This is what I said. Because I'm just like, you guys can freaking see planets around other stars. Like, why can't you see one here? Yeah. And they're like, listen, bud. <laughs> it's real far. It doesn't It doesn't make its own light. It only reflects the sun. And it could be made of coal. Which means it's just going to barely reflect anything. And they don't know where it is on its orbit. True. It has like a presumed like 50,000 year orbit around the sun. So it could be anywhere in that orbit. Damn. And that's a lot of sky. It doesn't seem like it's crazy, but it's a lot of sky. And you only get two or three nights of telescope time a year to look at like a small part well, of really the sky. I'm really glad that the sky is flat. So, you know, they can just. If it were, it'd be a lot it. easier. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah. Maybe the planets like at like an angle we can't see because it's like. Maybe. Maybe. Mm. Um, well, that. that makes sense that would also not only depend on that planet's rotation wouldn't it also be dependent on our rotation as well and like where we are in our cycle yeah it could be on the other side of the sun in which case we're not seeing it at night at all it's gonna it's gonna be a while because the telescope time is traditionally like at the same time every year so like maybe they'll do like a summer and a winter but sometimes they Mm -hmm. can't get it and if, if it's windy or like if the if the weather conditions are bad they have, and you need at least two nights to compare where everything is in the sky. Because if something moves faster than the background stars, that's how you know it's closer. So they're just kind of waiting for something to pass in front of a star, and they notice it. It sounds you, boring. <laughs> I swear, it's no, exciting. but it, it, it sounds interesting. It's fascinating. Sure. It'll be, this say, is like, like a perfect what? story too for a documentary because it takes like something that takes years and condenses it to an hour and a half, and you're like, this is the version I want to see. I don't want to deal with the years of of waiting and trying and looking at little tiny dots how long have they been trying to find this planet um i want to say 20 2018 i think they published the paper they they then started looking at old uh telescope data and then they started doing explicitly planet nine related searches so they're looking along like a very most probable areas where it could be because it's along the line of where all the planets are, because we all are in like the same plane. Um, yeah. But it could also have a little bit of a tilt. <laughs> so you got to look like there, everything else will look up here and up here and up here. And the camera is so, like, you think you just take a picture of the sky, but like the pictures they're taking, like they're maybe the size of the moon in the sky. So like that's how, and then that is full of billions of stars. So like, there's a lot going on Damn. up there. Anyway, when is we there... do find it, you'll hear about it, and then hopefully there'll be a movie about it afterwards. <laughs> I believe. Uh, I believe. I, I believe it as well. Has Has there been a lot of momentum since the James Webb Telescope has like gone up? Are they able to utilize no, because any of that photography? That's not going to be a survey telescope, so that's going to be okay. like specifically looking at at things. I mean, I don't know exact. I mean, who knows? But what they ha- what the what is coming up is this thing called the uh Vera Rubin telescope which is going to be in Chile and the top of the Andes where other telescopes are and that's going to take that's going to be an automated telescope that every night 
just kind of like scans as much of the sky as it can in a night. Nice. And that's going to produce so much data. It's going to be a ludicrous amount of data, but it's also going to be all public. So all of a sudden, all that data and all those oh. pictures are available for anyone. So if you really want to be cool, you can discover the ninth planet by looking at that data. And yeah. if you discover it and you're right, that's yours. You name it. Well, you don't really get to name it. That's a. It's a but it it Pluto Julie. But it fields the re- like that information to not just the scientific community, but like the international public who might have a different way of thinking yeah. about it. Because at the end of the day, it sounds like all all these scientists all they care about is finding it and discovering it because that's mm-hmm. th- that's what they want and that's what they're fueled by so it if they can put it out to the world and somebody has a different perspective they're not thinking of that is like uh, that's going to be super helpful and you go from having like two data points a year three data points a year to having 50 to maybe 100 different times that that sure. part of the sky has been photographed and so we're going to discover so many things in the in within our own solar system by this telescope it's going to be kind of too much but hopefully one of the bigger <laughs> findings is is a new planet but you're going to hear about like a Wait, bunch of asteroids exactly. we're going to find a name and and locate all the asteroids and their paths and all the comets and every, everything that like we kind of know about like some of the things we're going to learn basically everything in the next 10 years off this telescope. And then the James Webb telescope is going to be able to focus and get like a real high res image of it. And that's kind of where that comes in. Once we know where it is and where where it's going to be, then we can use that one because we can't just like point that anywhere and be like, I don't know what's there. That makes sense. Maybe they're doing that. I doubt it though. Thank you for clarifying. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe edit that part out. (laughs) No, I was going to say it's super interesting. Yeah. It, how, how does it feel to kind of become like a, I, I like to think of it like with my job, I have to become like a jack of all trades of a variety of things. Mm-hmm. Like, do you, do you find yourself kind of being that within every single community that you go? Kind of. I, yeah, I, I, one of my favorite parts about even editing a documentary is like, you learn so much about the subject and cause you have to know way more than it's in the movie. So I, I, like did finishing editing on a movie about the music of Laurel Canyon in the late sixties. And now I know way yeah. too much about it. <laughs> and I know all the stories <laughs> that were cut from the movie, you know, like I know all that. And like cheerleading, like I know so much about cheerleading now I can identify like a two to full full and you're just like, all right, buddy. So yeah, it's, it's really fun to, to learn. Like that's one of my favorite parts is that I just get to learn so much. And like, I didn't know anything about astronomy before we started the planet nine subject, but I've, I met and spent ample time with like some of the most well-known and like revered astronomers in the, in the United States, at least, and if not the world, like this guy, like discovered most of the moons of Jupiter. And I'm just like hanging out with him in Maine. (laughs) No big deal. I've had that experience where you're just sitting there like with the camera, you're pressing record and you're trying to continue going, but you're having that many existential crisis of like, does this matter? And then you're like, no, <laughs> yes, it does. Because I'm, I'm the one who's telling that story. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. No one else is really doing this, which is cool for us, but. So what is it that, so I, I guess I'd call planet nine upcoming a spiritual successor to behind the curve and yeah. is that looking out into space and making those kinds of documentaries? Is that something that you're hoping to continue building on that thread throughout your career? And what is it that you would like to, what is the direction that you'd like to explore with that? I think, I think you're right that Planet Nine is like a spiritual successor, but it's more so because we're showing the scientific process for what it is and and as painfully yeah. slow as it is and showing that scientists are not out there like trying to get famous and trying to make tons of money like they don't make tons of money like that's just not how it works so yeah. it's kind yeah. of our rebuttal to a lot of arguments that we heard during behind the curve which is like that science is bad or whatever you know science can't be trusted and we're kind of showing that science can be trusted and should be that's one of our things with that but looking beyond that i don't think that science is necessarily our pigeonhole. I think what we like is uh, 
subcultures and complex subjects that we can break down for people. So with Behind the Curve, let's call it like we wanted to break down belief structures and belief in general. With mm. Planet Nine, it's going to be the scientific process and what it really looks like and what scientists are really like beyond just like the report that they write, the boring thing that nobody reads. But, you know, we have a lot of other things that we hear, like, you, we're kind of, we kind of just like watch TV or just live life and go like, what's up with that person? <laughs> like, that's an interesting <laughs> thing. I wonder if there's something about them that exists. And if it exists, we're like, cool, it exists. Great. Don't need to worry about it. We'll watch it and enjoy it. And if it doesn't exist, we're like, crap, right. now we have to make that so we can understand it. Is there, is there like a, I'll do a pun intended. Is there like a North star or like the dream story that you want to tell? Or is it one of those just inspiration moments that pop up when you see it? There's nothing that like jumps out to me as like something I've just always wanted to make a documentary about, but I, I do the things that I really love and I'm always impressed by are like really long-term projects. Like something I'm interested in is politicians who like have all this aspiration and then they just start making concession after concession and become someone they're not. I don't know if you tell that in a documentary, but like, and even if you could, like, would they let you like yeah. actively, like I want to be there on the ground. Just kind of be there from the day by day. Yeah. And like be there to... when they, like they win their, their small race as little kids or whatever, like PTA and then move on to like the school board and, you know, just keep rising until they become president and then you're still there following them and they're like making all these concessions. And the real life parks and rec. Deals with, sure, yeah. Oh, but that, that is because at least like I think what you have a very unique ability to do is to hum, humanize the the people who we might disagree with because they, they, at the end of the day, that's what they are. They're human, no matter how much we might not like what they say. A politician, I think, would be a prime example, uh, like the the pinnacle of uh, how do you get to the root and vulnerability of somebody who is making makes a career out of losing and pivots from that to go into government because that is a very like weird specific personality type. Yeah. It's very interesting but we're we're we'll all for that. you making that Thanks. story <laughs> that's what we're trying to say I've we'll cast help a wide you... net yeah yeah we'll help you find somebody from like standard city council and to them trying to be president we'll help you find that guy or <laughs> or lady daniel thank you so much for hanging out with us and chatting with us today um we would like to know before we we take off today what is your future good what are you excited about making? What is uh, coming out right now? What, 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 where can people find you? There is a series on Vice TV right now uh, called In My Own World, which is kind of a spinoff of Behind the Curve that we executive produced and created uh, with Vice. And it's cool. It kind of looks at other subcultures. Each episode is like a different kind of person. And they have pretty wacky beliefs, but the people are all very just people. So that's what we're looking at there. Um, we have our Planet Nine thing that's coming up. I do a lot of comedy videos too. We didn't really talk about that, but I do a lot of comedy sketches. And can you tell us the name of the comedian that you you've been working? Because yeah. we're absolutely going to butcher it. But so, so speaking of like Notre Dame connections, I met this guy at Notre Dame. He was a student, and I was working there, and we met. We started making sketch videos then, and we still do it today. His nice. name is Joe Quazala. K-W-A-C-Z-A-L-A. -A -A. He's got a Comedy Central special. He's a very funny guy. Very nice guy. Yes. Um, he, no, he really is. <laughs> and he and he I have really... been friends for a very, very long time now. And, you know, we continue to get along and make fun stuff. And I really respect him as a comedian. And he thinks I'm good enough to make his videos. So it's all it all works out. So I do a lot of stuff with him. And um, we made two video drops one of 31 videos and one of 21 videos a couple years apart just all in one day we just popped all these videos out so we have 52 wow. videos available if you want to watch them <laughs> <Holy crap. laughs> yeah and they're there if you go to jokewasala.com you can get those and see all his nice. work and then my stuff is delta v productions 
uh, is our company and, you know, we're working on stuff all the time and we'll put all our updates there. And then for any of my stupid little things in between, you go to DJC film. And that's also my Instagram and Twitter thingy. So that's where I am. Nice. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on LinkedIn. <laughs> Damn, I was Probably totally going to pimp out your LinkedIn page. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was all Joe's idea, actually, because I had a different name, and he's like, once Behind the Curve came out, it was like Haphazard Goat, and it was like this thing that I had since high school, and it didn't make any sense, and he was like, hey, uh, if you're going to do this, you you have to change your, your Instagram label. Like, I won't stand by as a friend and let you do this to yourself. So, and somehow DJC Film was available. I didn't have to worry about it. It just was there already, so. Yeah, you know what? That that's that's the moniker of a good friend. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Daniel, thank you so much for hanging with us and for chatting. And I I've learned so much from you today. Like, Same. Nice. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for being with us, and cannot wait for Planet Nine documentary. <laughs> I know. Me I'm, neither. I'm on the edge of my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make 10 years go by real quick. Yeah. yeah. Can we, yep. Can we do that? Cool. Amazing. Cool. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. Absolutely. All right. All right. T- t- <laughs> take 911. <laughs> That's very specific. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, everybody. And yeah. Damn, that was a good interview. I, yeah. I learned a lot from that interview. A lot. Yeah, me but too. Before, before I chat about what I learned, I want to know what you learned. What did you learn from Daniel Clark? I've since we've had that interview and something that I have been having a conversation with myself because I, I'm also an editor and I know the ins and outs of what Daniel goes through, not just with his directing work, but also his editing work and producing work is like really just what stands out to me. It, what he said documentarians are not journalists and Truth. talking about the lack of accountability for uh for filmmakers in not just documentary but all aspects and i think that that's not something we always talk about in the sense because it because it's art and yeah. how do you quantify like how people respond how do you art responsibly? And I think it's thinking about how do you have a discussion about accountability and how you represent your subject, how you how you tell a story and do that from a place of honesty, mm-hmm. of being truthful. Because there are the complicated matters of like, you know, if you are... You want to tell as much of the truth as you can, but you're, it's not like a journalist where it's like you're standing in front of the camera, you may have some B-roll, but you're kind of just like stating the facts, whereas like a documentary, you have to compress maybe 60 hours plus footage into an hour and a half, and yeah. that all has to make sense. So there's a lot of the questions of, you know, where where does the truth lie in you know, what you're trying to show, what is the investment that, like, you want people to have, Mm -hmm. and also, like, are you representing people exactly as they, or or the communities that you want to represent, even in this case, and with fringe communities, how exactly you want to represent them, and it's something that I've really been trying to have a conversation with myself about, like, what we do here. Because we take a lot of pride in us being able to share people's stories who let us share their yeah. stories and try to do that responsibly. So thank you, and Daniel. Exactly. And the, so thank you, Daniel, for giving us some more to think about as we continue our journey here. Yes, very yeah. much so. Mike, what did you learn? What did I learn? Yeah. Uh, I learned to shut the fuck up. Um, I was going to say, you're a little, you were a little quiet there. Exactly. Uh, the biggest thing that I learned from chatting with Daniel was literally shutting up and yep. allowing the subject to speak. Uh, I am very much an extrovert, very much a performer, and I have always been the 
one that fills in that weird, awkward silence void Mm -hmm. and figuring out like the way to just make things not as weird. Um, such as today when I was on a client call and there was a good, probably 25 seconds of pure silence as a client was trying to pull something up on their screen. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to hurry up and find some random thing to say at this moment to get a conversation going again. But learning that when you flip it around and when you're going into an interview and you're chatting with somebody, or even sometimes too, when you're just having an interpersonal communication that asking a question and then just being quiet and letting the person talk and letting them hear and letting yourself hear exactly what they're trying to say goes a long way. And when you're doing these documentaries or even for us, when we're doing these podcasts, we ask a question. If we're allowing a little bit of silence to go, you will get so much juicy information. And that's some of the moments I love the most when it comes to documentaries are those little hits of humanness of, of, of authenticity mm-hmm. that comes from that brief moment of silence after they go on a whole tangent and then it's quiet and yeah. then they say something very insightful and can't get that if you're just sitting there blabbing the whole time and just like yeah so let me ask you that next question no take a step back ask that question get the tr- full answer from it and actually hear them out yeah. And if you do that, gold star for you, man. Gold star. Absolutely. I felt like that was such a powerful thing. And we let him, especially like as I, as I was editing this episode, I wanted to take advantage of like his, uh, you know, his silence and let that breathe. Because I think giving people the ability to hear, uh, we've talked about it. Now let's hear the purpose of that. And it, was a different conversation than I think you and I have had because we could, I felt like I could craft my questions a little better for for him. I also just thought it was kind of more of a lesson yeah. for us. Yeah. So just going into it, it's just like, oh yeah, just ask questions, treat people respectfully. And, uh, you know, you don't yeah. need to go into everything attacking somebody. Not that we do. No, uh, but like, <laughs> just give give people the respect, and they'll show your respect back. Do yes. good, get good, feel good. Um, whatever way we say that, just that's exactly how I said it. But um, we're not like. It doesn't people matter good. what the order is. It's it all about anymore. yeah. Your process is your process. Be good, but it was a very great conversation please let us know what you thought about it leave us a review on apple uh follow us on spotify like and subscribe on youtube remember again we're on youtube you can see our beautiful faces you can see our guests beautiful faces you can you can see theirs you can see byron's bright ass red beard and Mm -hmm. be surprised at how big it is we love you guys and thank you so much for all your support that you've been giving us again much love Feel Much good love. Shoes. Don't forget to follow us on the social medias at Feel Good Pod on Instagram, TikTok, wherever else you can find us on the social medias. If you want to get in contact sure with can. us as well, Feel Good Podcast at gmail dot com. We'd love to hear from you about any kind of uh, suggested guests that you'd like to hear us uh, chat with, or just you want to come and you want to say hi, and we'd love to hear from you. We're here. Yeah. So until next time, guys, we will catch you all on the flip, 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 the You can also find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you on the flip-flop.